Welcome to the State of the Night ADRC presentation. My name is John Morris, and I'm pleased to be able to give this presentation. I do want to um, talk about another event that will be coming up next month. It's our annual pre-AAIC poster session. It's going to be on July the 11th from 4 to 5.30 in EPNIC, seminar rooms A and B. We want everyone who will be presenting at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference next month in Amsterdam, if you're presenting a poster, it's a great idea to present at this pre-poster session. And that not only allows you to share your work with all of us at the ADRC who won't be going to Amsterdam, but it also gives you a chance to sort of have a dry run for your poster presentation. Uh, we're going to be presenting two awards this year for the first time. Each will be $500, one for the uh, the uh, poster presentation that's voted best poster in best basic science and one best poster in clinical and translational science. Now, it's not limited to people who are presenting at AAIC, but any early stage investigator who may have a poster for another uh, a purpose is uh, invited to join this event as well. Uh, Jennifer Phillips is the person to contact if you want to present and you only have a week for your RSVP due by June the 20th, 2023 at the poster session itself on July 11th in the afternoon, we'll have uh, some uh, hors d'oeuvres and some beverages. So please, uh, if you are an early stage investigator, please uh, go ahead and um, sign up for this. And if you're a more senior person, have your uh, trainees sign up for it. All right, well, let's begin. So here are my disclosures. I have uh, some consulting relationships, but none with uh, pharma or industry. And as I begin, I want to give special thank to, uh, as always, Krista Mulder and Marissa Streitz for uh, helping uh, pre prepare the uh, PowerPoint. And uh, as always, uh, Linda Kruger, who is uh, home today because she arranges my schedule and ensured that I would actually be here to present. So I appreciate that. Uh, this year, we uh, have uh, two uh, very distinguished faculty in the Knight ADRC who uh, have retired or are retiring. But the first is Anne Fagan Niven. She arrived at Washington University in 1995, joined the Holtzman Laboratory, and uh, over the years really became um, uh, a leader in developing fluid biomarkers to investigate Alzheimer's disease and preclinical Alzheimer's disease. She had some very important manuscripts. She was the first to show that a low A beta level, A beta 42 level in the CSF correlated with amyloid pet burden. And she was the first to show that preclinical Alzheimer's disease is not benign. If you do have amyloid in the brain and you're not demented, you are at risk for future cognitive decline. And she staged the preclinical AD spectrum using CSF biomarkers. She was our core leader for our adult children study, for our Diane and Diane TU studies, and for many external uh, initiatives. She is very prominent internationally and very collaborative, and she worked hard to standardize and validate biomarkers. She had to step down from her active faculty position here at the School of Medicine and the Knight ADRC because of health re reasons. Fortunately, uh, her uh, mentee and friend, uh, Suzanne Schindler, uh, was associate leader for the Fluid Biomarker Corps and was able to succeed uh, Anne as core leader and as leader of Project 2. So um, uh, we will uh, later have a, a recognition ceremony for all that Anne has done for the Knight ADRC. May I now ask uh, Dave Belota to come down to the podi podium? So as Dave is coming, uh, he received his uh, bachelor's degree in psychology in 1956 at UMSL and then his PhD in experimental psychology in 1981, University of Southern California, came to Washington University in 1985, 
with his uh, laboratory and life partner, Jan Ducek, and they both contributed to the launch of the ADRC at Washington University and became very important for its success. And you can see that in a short time, Dave was promoted to professor of psychology and in recognition for his contribution to the Knight ADRC professor of neurology. He is a outstanding cognitive psychologist. He's uh, done many things, but included in uh, a major area has been examining memory-based attentional control. And he's trained several uh, ADRC faculty and postdoctoral associates, including active members, Brian Gordon, Andy Ashenbrenner, Peter Millar, and Nicole Mackay came here to, to uh, work uh, temporarily with Dave. He's had many important roles in the university, including as faculty representative to the Board of Trustees and has received the highest faculty award for anyone on the Danforth campus in 2014, the Arthur Hawley Compton Faculty Achievement Award. So Dave is in a phased retirement now, but he retires officially as of June 30th. Is that correct? And Dave, if you'll come over here, we have a little something to commemorate all of your service. You come on this side <laughs> and you can take a look at it and oh, read it to the group. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> From the Knight ADRC, the Knight ADRC recognizes David Belota, PhD for exemplary service. And it gives the years of official um, um, uh, involvement with the Knight ADRC. It's a, Glass, well, no one can see, but let's, let's hold it. Thank you so much. All right, just so we're all on the same page, the Memory and Aging Project was the first organized uh, Alzheimer research study done at the uh, Washington University led by the founding director of our Knight ADRC and my mentor, Leonard Berg. It, we've continued the name, the Memory and Aging Project to describe the protocols that we use to assess our participants clinically and cognitively and of course, it encompasses the faculty and staff who administer the protocols. We're supported uh, when we do these assessments by grants. The original Alzheimer's Disease Research Center grant was awarded in 1985 and has been continuously renewed. Our benefactors, Charles and Joanne Knight in 2010, gave a substantial endowment gift to the Knight ADRC and henceforth it's called the Knight ADRC. We have two other major multi-component grants are both program project grants are both linked healthy aging and senile dementia grant that was actually awarded in 1984 for the first time even before the adrc grant and then the antecedent biomarkers of alzheimer's disease the adult children study awarded in, initially in 2005 they also have been continuously renewed no matter what grant a participant is actually enrolled in the memory and aging project under all the assessments take place at the Memory and Aging Clinical Research Office and the participants don't know if they're in the ADRC or the HASD or whatever. 2008, we had a fourth large, uh, major grant, the Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer Network. This is an international study. We strive to be interdisciplinary at the Knight ADRC and I think we've succeeded. We have faculty from 13 departments here at the School of Medicine and for many years have had uh, relationships with uh, individual faculty from um, the Danforth campus, including, as I just mentioned with Dave Belota, the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences and the Brown School of Social Work and the Institute of Public Health. We also have um, uh, uh, collaborations with uh, people at the uh, Olin Business School uh, in, uh, to look at ways to be more effective and efficient in enrolling uh, participants into clinical trials and in the Department of Political Science with Matt Gobble to understand the motivation for why individuals do participate in Alzheimer research. Uh, this is probably too small for people to read, but I wanted to point out in the upper left-hand corner the 
program project, Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia, because it supports four interlinked projects trying to determine the molecular biomarkers that, that, uh, uh, that characterize uh, preclinical Alzheimer's disease, a potential treatment for Alzheimer's disease, and a potent, and potential indicator for why someone may move from asymptomatic to symptomatic Alzheimer's disease, looking at sleep and orexin. Uh, genes can confer risk for developing Alzheimer's disease, but also resilience, and we're studying those genes. And we're uh, very interested in moving into the digital assessment world with uh, 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 Dr. Hassenstab and his cognitive, uh, smartphone-based cognitive assessments. The, uh, the adult children's study in the lower uh, right corner in yellow, actually, yeah, oh, your left, I guess, uh, is uh, looking at tau and, and how it spreads and moves from preclinical to symptomatic Alzheimer's disease, looking at fluid biomarkers that predict risk for developing symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. And then two new projects for us, one looking at inflammation as mediated by the gut microbiome and how it influences Alzheimer's disease. And then uh, the role of physical activity. Does that prevent or modify risk for Alzheimer's disease? In the blue grant, we don't have long standing projects, but we have five de developmental projects, each about two years in length looking at a variety of topics here. I'm just going to point out the bottom blue one called uh, Exploring the Impact of Payment on Recruitment. This is a, a, a pilot study being done by Jessica Mazursky with Matt Gobble, because we're going to be moving to remunerate our participants for their clinical and cognitive assessments. We're gonna remunerate their study partners. We have been remunerating the participants for imaging and lumbar puncture and so forth, but we think it's now time to, uh, to give reimbursement for their time for the clinical assessments as well. Uh, in the middle are all the cores. I won't belabor them, uh, but we do have a distinctive core uh, that I don't think any other Alzheimer's disease center has, and that's one that devoted to examining health disparities and equity, and it's led by Joy Balls Berry. Our overarching themes, we have many, many, many science, uh, scientific uh, initiatives and are trying to address many questions, but we want to know when does the Alzheimer process begin in the brain during one's lifespan? When does it start? And if people harbor the beginnings of Alzheimer's disease, what are the risks for developing Alzheimer's, preclinical Alzheimer's disease, where I already mentioned inflammatory changes and in physical activity, but cerebral vascular disease. I mentioned sleep, but social determinants of health. And as you've heard, we're very interested in what influences the transition from asymptomatic to symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. Ultimately, what we would like to do is so well characterize the preclinical phase of Alzheimer's that we can initiate disease-modifying therapies before people become symptomatic. That is, we want to prevent or e uh, prevent uh, symptomatic Alzheimer's disease at people who are at elevated risk to develop it. Now we have these three grants. They're for, awarded for five years uh, budget period, and then we have to be submitting an application to say that we deserve another five years. For the ADRC grant, the current budget period is from May 2020 to April 2025. So we have to submit next June our renewal application. If it's approved and we are awarded, then we can begin funding again uh, right after the end date in April of 2025 of the current budget period will be set with the first year of the next budget period in May of 2025. For our program project grant, Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia, we're going to uh, have the, our fifth budget year end next April. So if we um, want to, wanted to, uh, to do something similar with the ADRC grant, we should have already submitted our renewal application, but we, we're not doing that. 
What we are going to do is look at our adult children's study. This is the uh, span of the current budget period, 2021 to 2026. So we'll have to submit the renewal in, uh, for the adult children's study in May of 2025, and we're going to link it to the HASD renewal. Matter of fact, they're going to become one mega grant. And so they'll both start if we're awarded a funding, we'll start in May of 2026 and go to uh, 2031. So this is our super program project grant. We don't want to re relinquish the funds that were awarded by each one. Uh, we don't wanna have to contract our budget. So our program officer at the National Institute of Aging has said that we will have a budget uh, permission permit a budget that is equivalent to the two individual uh, program project grants. This uh, idea not only has been endorsed by the National Institute on Aging, but by our external advisory uh, uh, committee, and we will apply for two years of a no cost extension for the HASD program project grant. And as I say, that brings everything into alignment. We can submit the super grant in May of 2025. This is still a good time to be doing Alzheimer's disease research. Here is the uh, fiscal year 2023 budget, another increase for Alzheimer's disease and related dementia research. And look at the pay lines for uh, uh, grants that are being submitted to the National Student Aging. For all grants, and this primarily is R01, if, you're, if your requested budget is under half a million dollars, you have about a 10% chance of being awarded. If it's over half a million dollars, only a 7% chance. But if you it's linked to Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, you have a 25% chance of being awarded. So that's quite, quite good. Same for new investigators and early stage investigators for program project grants at NIA, the success rate is about 19% for ADR, uh, ADRD related program projects, uh, 35%. So submit now why the, why the funding is good. In green here, we show the uh, uh, of our uh, current available funding that about a third, maybe a little more comes from our grant support. But the majority comes from philanthropy. We have been very fortunate to have people like Charles and Joanne Knight uh, understand the importance of Alzheimer's disease and provide us with resources to be able to go beyond what the federal grants allow and really try to defeat this illness. So our available to us now, we have about $25 million, uh, of which about a third is, is grant funding. We don't have to spend the expendable funds, we can save them as need be, but they become very important for us to be able to do things, as I say, that the grants would not permit. Um, so we have endowments that uh, exceed $15 million. Uh, many of these uh, of this uh, uh, comes um, uh, in grants, uh, in, in uh, bequests from individuals, uh, many of them who have been my patients and uh, despite the fact I was their physician, they still seem to be grateful. Uh, and it's, uh, it's really remarkable uh, because we can use these funds to do things that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So I'm going to show you that you know, we've rapidly expanded our clinical core and we you know, didn't put the expansion into our budget request when we submitted our grant. So we're using expendable funds for that. We have a new project manager, new social worker, uh, other uh, staff. We've added uh, uh, clinicians, and I'll show you that in just a moment. And we've added, a, uh, in a big way, a blood tests to look at uh, not only uh, Alzheimer biomarkers, but now cerebral vascular risk. Uh, we support research out of our expendable funds, including imaging studies and developmental projects. We markedly expanded our clinical trials unit of the Knight ADRC with uh, staffing. We've augmented our neuropathology core, added a faculty member, an auto stainer. 
As I mentioned, our unique Health Disparities and Equity Core helps support the expansion of the Fluid Biomarker Core. And we're going to add a new core to the Knight ADRC. I'll talk about this uh, towards the end. It's called the Traditional Core. A major uh, area of support, and one I think that has been much needed, is we're going, we have a uniform platform now to track specimens across four cores, the fluid biomarker core, so that's cerebral spinal fluid and blood, genetics, <laughs> neuropathology, and biomarker cores. And of course, the clinical core is important because it's the um, participants who uh, provide these uh, uh, specimens to be tracked. We, uh, up until about a year, uh, less than a year ago, we were collecting biospecimens and each core was managing their biospecimens on different platforms so that no, they weren't integrated one with the other. We had very difficult time knowing if participant A provided spinal fluid uh, and for the fluid biomarker core and the genetic and blood that the genetics core used for DNA extraction to link the two. But now this Freezer Works provides us, this platform provides us uh, a uniform uh, biospecimen inventory, and we're using the ex uh, expendable funds to do this. We went live with Biomarker in uh, October 2022. All new, newly collected biospecimen data now is being managed by Freezer Works. We have a lot of legacy data. We have to go back and uh, put in freezer works also, and we're planning to do that, but that takes uh, takes some time. You know, the Knight ADRC is um, really a reflection of its participants. I'll talk about them in just a moment, its staff and its faculty and investigators. I mentioned the four major grants, HASD, uh, Adult Children's Study, ADRC, and Diane. But the faculty uh, uh, are very successful in uh, applying for and being awarded uh, grants from uh, the National Institutes of Health. So these are new applications that were funded in 2021 and 2022, uh, linked by uh, topic areas. Uh, but it's remarkable how uh, productive and successful our, our faculty are. Uh, the participants and the data that they generate are known throughout the world. Uh, we are asked to contribute to uh, collaborative research efforts. Uh, the first one is awarded to someone in Australia, Alzheimer, Dementia Onset and Progression in International Cohorts, and they want our data and specimens from Adult Children's Study and HASD, a preclinical Alzheimer disease consortium, also including Australia, but uh, four studies, uh, including the adult children's study here in the United States. Uh, moving online assessments, uh, we do our clinical assessments in the Memory and Aging Project in person. Well, perhaps in the years to come, we will find that online methods may be uh, as successful and uh, easier to, uh, to effect. So we're looking along with uh, four other uh, ADRCs at a validation of online methods for assessing cognition. We're looking again in a multi-center collaboration about uh, the blood-brain barrier and its breakdown as a potential factor in developing Alzheimer disease dementia. A number of uh, grants that look at statistical modeling of aging and risk. And Kenji Zhang, our data management and biostatistics core leader is leading a cross-sectional and longitudinal study of potential racial differences in molecular biomarkers with, uh, uh, with uh, collaborators at Emory University, Penn, Wisconsin, and University of Alabama, Birmingham. And a new study will begin at the University of Wisconsin uh, for uh, imaging studies. So they come to us because our participants and our data are so valuable. And here's another example of that. So again, in the past two years, we've had 166 total requests uh, from investigators, both within Washington University and external to Washington University for access to our participant data that can support their own research. Almost 100 requests for biospecimens 
uh, again, fluids, uh, CSF, blood, but also uh, 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 brain tissue. And because our participants are so well characterized and so committed, uh, many uh, uh, studies want to recruit them uh, because they're deeply phenotyped and, uh, and very, uh, very willing to participate in research. So 320 total requests in a two-year period. Uh, and again, our faculty very productive, uh, over 300 publications in that same uh, time period. New initiatives that we've begun, uh, we've just started the uh, evaluation of what it will take to understand how best to reimburse people for their clinical and cognitive assessments. But I mentioned the uh, online clinical assessments, and this means adaptation of our uh, dementia staging instrument, the clinical dementia rating into an electronic form, the ECDR, in a study called Electronic Evaluation or Eval Study led by investigators at University of California, San Francisco. Uh, I'll mention uh, the role of the uh, potential role of social and structural determinants of health. So we need to collect relevant information for this. And Marissa Streitz led a team at the Memory and Aging Project to develop a new battery that we've implemented now for over a year to try to collect appropriate information about social determinants of health. Blood-based biomarkers are the wave of the future, we think, but to understand how well they correlate with traditional biomarkers in the cerebral spinal fluid and, and PET uh, imaging, both with amyloid and tau, we need to do lots of assessments. So we've asked our participants to donate lots of blood. Sarah Hartz and Jessica Mazursky have a, a grant to look at how to return to our participants the results of their studies. If they have an abnormal amyloid PET scan or an abnormal plasma test or, or a normal test, how do we communicate that to our participants? Not every participant wants to know, but those who do want to know, how do we communicate that? And most importantly, how do we communicate what that may mean for their risk of future Alzheimer's dementia? So that's a, quite a novel study. I mentioned uh, Jason Hassenstab and his remote cognitive testing under the um, uh, aegis of the Ambulatory Research and Cognition. And <laughs> we have a number of investigators interested in circadian rhythms and sleep and a new center in the Department of Neurology uh, called the Center on Biologic Rhythms and Sleep. Okay, alluded to the fact that we've turned over the Memory and Aging Project in a, in a way. Uh, when Leonard Berg started the Memory and Aging Project, uh, he was a uh, neurologist in private practice, and he was accustomed to doing every bit of his patient evaluations by himself. So he translated that to the research arena. The people who were assessing the research volunteers did everything. They enrolled the person, they did the form consent, they did the vital signs, they administered the protocols, they did the examination. And so it was always a model of physicians being key to the clinical research assessments. Well, our uh, faculty now, particularly our physician faculty, uh, almost all have other uh, interest besides clinical work. They're interested in clinical work, but many of them have their own laboratory or their own core, and so they're not freely available to come and do assessments whenever uh, we may need them. So we've augmented the original idea of physician-oriented uh, clinical assessments by adding nurse practitioners and a physician assistant. We still have five neurologists, one psychiatrist, and one geriatrician on the clinical assessment team. We can always do better, but we are uh, committed to increasing the diversity of our faculty and our staff. If we want to be uh, more representative in our research, we need to have a more diverse research cohort. And in order to have a more diverse research cohort, we have to have a diverse staff and a diverse faculty. Of the seven physicians I've mentioned that conduct clinical assessments, four are women, one is black. Of our Memory and Aging Project staff, 25 are women, three are black, two are Latina. 
Uh, and we're going to add Ji Young Han, and if she's still alive in two years, uh, uh, she, she's doing yeoman work in our uh, faculty outpatient practice uh, now. Uh, but uh, at the end, her obligation there will be markedly reduced in 2025, and she will come back to the Memory and Aging Project. Our uh, recruitment team is make, made up of many people, but certainly our outreach, recruitment, and engagement core. That has four women, two of whom are black, and the health disparities and equity core uh, is made up of four women and one man, and all are black. So here's the organizational chart for the Memory and Aging Project. Uh, very, and this is uh, transpired, as I keep saying, within the past year. Very pleased uh, and relieved that Nicole Elmore. Uh, a nurse uh, practitioner has agreed to uh, succeed Maria Carroll, who, who left uh, for a period of time uh, as the associate director of the Memory and Aging Project. Uh, Nicole uh, leads a, a group of six nurses uh, listed under nurse coordinators uh, and our social workers, uh, three social workers, um, and we uh, just as of uh, uh, the first of this month uh, added a program manager, Megan Lang, who is responsible for our study assistants and other coordinators. I mentioned our adva advanced practice clinicians, Nicole Elmore, Tanya Hart, Abby Arnold, and Madeline Pachinski as our physician assistant. Uh, in yellow, you can see the faculty physician clinicians that I mentioned earlier. Also, two others, Eric McDade and Eric Music, remain as clinicians, although they're not now uh, available because of other commitments to do clinical assessments. And then uh, Jason uh, leads our cognitive assessment unit. It's managed by Lisa Schoolcraft uh, as the clinical research uh, specialist, and then three uh, uh, individuals who do co the cognitive assessments. Now in the past year in blue are the new additions. So we've ha had uh, quite, a, quite a number of new individuals uh, join us and we're very pleased to welcome uh, all of them. So our memory and aging project participants, numbers 736 total supported by the three grants. Of those, 429 are 65 years and older, and 307 are uh, 40, uh, beginning at 40 years are in the adult children's study. So our age range spans a great number of years, 40 to almost 100. 55% of our uh, <clears throat> Memory and Aging Project participants are women. 16% in total are African-American or Black. And of course, they come primarily from Missouri and, and uh, uh, Illinois, but they come uh, from 21 states in total, including California and Idaho in the West, Texas in the South, and New Hampshire in the East. And one participant just completed his 36 years of annual assessments, so pretty remarkable. Matter of fact, at our Memory and Aging Project participants meeting on June the 3rd, he, he came with his son, even though the night before he had fallen and sustained facial injuries and was in the emergency room, but he wanted to be released so he could be at the Memory and Aging Project participants meeting. COVID. In March of 2020, we ceased in-person assessments. So, a matter of fact, our observational clinical research stopped. We weren't doing uh, in-person clinical assessments or cognitive assessments. We certainly were not doing imaging or lumbar puncture or blood draws. We moved towards remote assessments and that began about a month or so after March of 2020. And we were able to collect data and most importantly, I think, stay in touch with our participants, many of whom were feeling very isolated. But in March of 2021, we very gingerly began resuming in-person assessments. We had a number of uh, stipulations about who would be eligible to come to the Memory and Aging Project and who of our staff would be there because our staff had all been working remotely. But you see over a period of months, we 
uh, increased the number of weekly in-person assessments in 2021 to around 30, which would be about half of what our pre-pandemic uh, assessment, uh, weekly assessment mode, uh, monthly assessment load was, which would be about 60. Uh, we thought we were doing pretty well in November of 2021, and maybe we could ramp up to in, increase the number of, of participants. But then the Omicron variant came, and we had to shut down completely again in January of 2022. Fortunately, that did not last long. And so by March of 2022, we could resume our in-person assessments. And by, I better catch up here. And by, um, by uh, uh, November of 2022, we reached our pre-pandemic uh, um, 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 uh, completed assessments of about 60 or so a month. And we're continuing to increase because as I've said, we've added our assessment capacity with our advanced practice clinicians. Now, we normally get our imaging protocols and our CSF collection every three years. So, but from 2020, when March of 2020, when we shut down to when we've now ramped up here in January, 2023 to where we uh, were pre-pandemic, that's three years of people not coming in for their imaging and their lumbar punctures. So we're way behind. So we're trying to accelerate the collection of our biomarkers you can see uh, the number of completed biomarkers in 2019 before the shutdown for lumbar puncture was about 150 in a year. And we're on track to get pretty close to that, 144 we project through 2023. MRI had been 128, but we think we can get up to around 300. Amyloid PET, we were at 128, we wanna get up to 230 or so, and the same for tau pet. So we're everyone has worked together very, very well to try to make up for lost time. And this is very important. Remember, the NIA funds our grants, and they're very aware that we didn't spend money during the pandemic because we weren't doing imaging or lumbar puncture or even in-person assessments. And they're sitting on all that, we're sitting on all the money they've given us and they say, well, you better hurry up and do this and it will be important for the success of our renewal applications to show that we can accelerate and get back to where we need to be. We can't answer the research questions we address without the appropriate number of participants completing all these assessments. So we're working hard. Fortunately, we have the best group of participants in the world. And I think you can see here just how remarkable they are. So about 83% have completed at least one amyloid PET, over 75% have completed at least one lumbar puncture, 88% of brain MRI, and uh, we started tau PET later, so it's a little bit lower, but over two thirds have done that. And our adult children are very committed, and you can see here, their completion rates of these biomarkers, not just at baseline assessment, which is remarkable, but the follow-ups every three years. So they keep coming back, they keep doing these studies for us. And of course, longitudinal data is the key if we're trying to understand Alzheimer's disease. So this level of commitment is truly remarkable. So here was the summary of the participants meeting held earlier this month. 391 of our 760 participants came with their study partners, 22% were black. And thanks to all the Knight ADRC faculty and staff who also attended, along with nine members of our African-American advisory board. The program was focusing on our early stage investigators, Allison Chen, from the Benziger lab is reporting on ventricular volume as an indication of uh, brain uh, neurodegeneration. Selena Washington, a, an assistant professor at St. Louis University was reporting on the uh, risk of falls in dementia. Nicole uh, Mackay from Benziger lab talked about domain specific cognition. And Hannah Wilkes was going to present on 
uh, individuals in the uh, memory and aging project who start out as cognitively normal, then seemingly become impaired, but the next time they come in, they're back to normal. So reversion and conversion. Unfortunately, Hannah had just been in an automobile accident, so her mentor, Jason Hassan, say I presented for her. Denise Head uh, runs Project 4 of the Adult Children's Study about the role of physical activity, and she presented. And Eric Music, one of our neurologists, talked about the new uh, drug, lecanabab, that we all anticipate will receive FDA approval within a month for the disease modifying, first disease modifying therapy for Alzheimer's disease. We also heard from our participants at this meeting as to why they are so committed and so dedicated. And that gentleman who completed his 36th uh, clinical assessment and came from the emergency room talked about why he was there. And we had a participant who has completed seven lumbar punctures over every three years, and she's having her eighth this month. The Knight ADRC is um, intimately involved in national, international uh, collaborations, but uh, we're really our strength is our support from people here in at home. We have a long standing relationship with the Greater Missouri Chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. If you remember, and I know you do because you all have excellent memories, the Memory and Aging Project began in 1979 under Leonard Berg brought in healthy older adults and people with senile dementia. That was the term used then. And no one who had senile dementia in category really understood dementia, much less Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's wasn't used. And as they were in the study, the family members would talk to one another and they had no idea about where to get information. So it was the family members of the first Memory and Aging Project cohort who started the chapter of the Alzheimer's Association 1981 here in St. Louis. That came from, from that original study. Uh, and we're very pleased with our continuing relationship with the uh, Greater Missouri chapter. Um, we have a fabulous African-American advisory board formed in 2000, uh, and they continue to uh, help us achieve at least some cultural competency and advise us in very important ways is how we can be more welcoming to all people. An ethics committee, uh, the St. Louis chapter of Lynx Incorporated, a, a group of uh, uh, highly accomplished African-American women, strong relationships with the uh, Harvey A. Friedman Center for Aging, uh, here on the Danforth campus and the Hope Center for Neurologic Disorders here on the medical school campus, our relationship with the Barnes Jewish Hospital Foundation, much support from the leadership of Washington University, and from alumni and development and medical public affairs. Now, I've mentioned donors and friends. I've highlighted the Knight family. I mentioned Charles and Joanne, but now Lester, their son, and Anne, their daughter, much involved and Roger and Paula Riney as particularly generous donors. <clears throat> Here's our African-American advisory board. <clears throat> as I say, they've been es essential for our mission to reach out to the community. They are all highly accomplished individuals and, and uh, have a range of, um, of expertise in education, the clergy, advocacy, healthcare, and communications. I know a number of the African-American Advisory Board members are here. I'm gonna ask you to stand, please. Come on, Beverly. Come on, Collins. Come on, Richard. Thank you. So coming out of the pandemic, and we think we're out of the pandemic, we have to thank our participants who stayed loyal to us when we couldn't see them in person. And as I say, now they're coming back and we have achieved more than full capacity, at least in terms of pre-pandemic terms. Our faculty and staff adapted to all of that period and they're back now and going wonderfully. And our trainees bring us great enthusiasm and new ideas and they keep, keep us young. 
Uh, I want to introduce uh, Ashley Jones, who is embarrassed, but standing up. Ashley just completed her first year of medical school at St. Louis University. And she is uh, spending the summer with us on a research project. She ultimate goal, who we will have to wait and see. She's kind of debating between psychiatry and neurology, but we all know that she'll end up in the right choice, neurology. And I don't know if Michelle Rudman is, yeah, Michelle's in the back, she's standing up. Michelle is completing her adult neurology residency this month and will join us as a postdoctoral fellow in July, so. And Aria Asfa is just received his doctoral degree from the University of Oklahoma. He's very interested in public health and particularly in the caregivers of people with dementia. And he's joining us as a postdoctoral fellow in July as well. All right, so disparities in Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. We know that there are tremendous disparities. The easy thing to think about is, well, there are genetic differences, other biologic differences, but increasingly we appreciate that the disparities are most, most influenced perhaps by social determinants of health. I mentioned that, I'll talk about it in just a bit. We at the Knight ADRC want to be better at understanding and addressing disparities. We have a, a grant, uh, Krista Mulder has a grant from the Cure Alzheimer Fund to share fluid, uh, fluids, uh, CSF and blood, plasma, with Emory University. So each of us can increase the number of uh, samples from uh, black participants. In 2018, we held the first national conference for Alzheimer's disease research centers and other uh, interested parties on African-American participation in Alzheimer research. And Joy Ballsberry in 2021 was given a grant to establish a community registry of individuals. She calls it the co-equal registry. This is very small, but I want to highlight a couple of facts. This is a study done by Suzanne Schindler of Memory and Aging Project participants, African-American and non-Hispanic whites. They were matched on age and other factors. Uh, there were 76 in each group. Uh, they were about 68 years of age. I've highlighted here that both the African-Americans and the whites had a mean educational level of a college graduate, 16 years of education. Now, what's interesting uh, here's the cerebral spinal fluid, A beta 42 to A beta 40 ratio. It is higher in the African Americans, that ratio, than it is in whites. Higher means less likelihood of Alzheimer pathology. As a matter of fact, we have a cutoff for Alzheimer pathology. Uh, seven, uh, 17 of the 76 Black participants, or 22%, were below the cutoff, meaning they likely had preclinical Alzheimer's versus 43% of the whites. So blacks less likely. The same for plasma, A beta 42 to 40, higher in blacks compared to whites. And when we look at amyloid pet burden, the number of individuals, uh, the, the number of the senoloid scale was very low, meaning less amyloid plaques in the black participants compared to the whites. And to meet the cutoff for preclinical Alzheimer's disease and amyloid PET, only 10% of blacks versus 40% of whites. So this suggests that although it's often said from large population studies that blacks are at higher risk of Alzheimer's disease than whites, we're not finding that at least in our biomarker evaluation. This is a social determinants of health battery that I mentioned. It measures uh, aspects of neighborhoods where people live, quality and quantity of education, one's social status, one's exposure to everyday discrimination, adverse experiences during childhood, stress, and social support. 
this is a, a very preliminary uh, uh, report on uh, the current um, uh, social determinants of health is measured by this battery in our memory and aging project participants with various adjustments. Uh, blacks much more likely than whites to attend uh, public school. Uh, so a fair number of whites went to private school. And look at this, uh, two thirds of blacks attended schools that were almost all black versus 25% uh, of whites uh, attended schools that were uh, segregated. More family support in blacks than whites, but a member of the household having a mental illness or being unemployed or being incarcerated much greater in black participants, negative aspects of the neighborhood in which they live, uh, much greater in blacks, being the target of insults or threats, or being shown disrespect, much higher in blacks than whites, and socioeconomic status lower in blacks and whites. So there are, our black participants do have uh, 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 ha have uh, experienced uh, these social determinants of health, but they still, at least by Dr. Schindler's report, have less ch chance of having Alzheimer's disease as measured by biomarkers. So we didn't find a consistent effect of social determinants health on our Alzheimer biomarkers, except perhaps for uh, education. Now, why don't we see a greater prevalence of a, a risk of Alzheimer's disease, at least measured by biomarkers in our Blacks, because they're college educated. I think the social determinants of health are much more related to risk for Alzheimer's disease in people of a, um, with less education, perhaps lower socioeconomic status. So this, in a way, is sad news that if Blacks truly have double the risk of Alzheimer's dementia. Uh, that's terrible, but it is potentially all remediable if we address social determinants of health. I mentioned the traditional cohort. So our biomarker cohort, mostly college graduates, we want to enroll people who come from the community. And to do that, we can't ask them to undergo serial imaging or lumbar puncture. So we're only gonna ask them to do the clinical and cognitive assessments. We want them to be 40 years and older. Uh, we want to better represent the population characteristics of St. Louis. We want to enroll more people with dementia. And uh, we want to uh, see if we can get some funding from the uh, National Institutes of Health to allow us to do this. But first we have to demonstrate the feasibility of doing it. So we're un un we have a pilot study ongoing now. We're going to have another national conference in November, in October. October the 2nd will be our 18th annual Norman R. Say lecture from four to five here at uh, the School of Medicine, probably at EPNEC. That will start this national conference, which then will run all day Tuesday, October the 3rd at EPNEC and a half a day on Wednesday. And registration information will be coming uh, soon. Uh, we'll uh, make sure you know this. We want a large attendance. Here are the individuals who are uh, already agreed to uh, present and those to help moderate and those to help organize it. If you look at the speakers, we have 22 speakers, 15 of whom are women, uh, eight are black, three identify as Asian, two is Hispanic and one is American Indian. So we're, we're uh, very pleased that all of these individuals are coming to Washington University to talk about uh, participation in Alzheimer research. This is a great time in Alzheimer's disease. As you, I came to the medical school in 82. I joined the dementia program in 1983. I never thought we'd have a blood-based test for Alzheimer's, never did. I never thought we'd have a disease modifying therapy, and at least in my career, and I think we do now with lecanabab, and we think denanabab will be right behind it uh, within the next six months. I want you to know that the NIDE ADRC and its program projects were very important in ushering in this area, the very first demonstration that there is preclinical disease in living people, uh, 
came from uh, amyloid PET study done by Mark Minton in 2006. I've already mentioned Ann Fagan was the first to show that preclinical Alzheimer's disease is not benign. It is increases your risk for becoming demented. She showed that with CSF data and I showed that with amyloid PET data a few years later. The Diane study, first ever prevention trial, Diane to you, started in 2012. And first trial to look at combination therapy, an anti-amyloid drug, an anti-tau drug launched in 2022. Drs. Bateman and Holtzman co-founded a company here in the Cortex Innovation District, C2N, that now has commercialized a blood test. So it's available now for clinical use called Precivity AD, and they're coming up with an even improved form of that, Precivity AD2. I'll just quickly mention a couple of trials at the night ADRC for anyone who sees uh, persons with dementia who may be interested in trial participation. Uh, a trial is beginning uh, in uh, probably the fall of this year to recruit a, a, a receptor, a Sigma-2 receptor uh, antagonist that may alter amyloid toxicity named CT1812. And likely two other studies will begin, but they're not as far along. One, an anti-amyloid antibody Remteranetug, uh, a uh, improved form of denanabab, and then another uh, antibody study, uh, but against sortulin that has the effect of elevating progranulin. So uh, there are trials looking for people with symptomatic Alzheimer's disease, but as I mentioned, we're also interested in prevention. So we are very much involved in studies of individuals who are cognitively normal, but may have a positive amyloid scan to taking uh, medications to reduce the amount of amyloid burden in the brain to see if that uh, <clears throat> prevents cognitive decline. Now I will uh, come up here again. I use this slide many times. We do not use the abbre abbreviation KADRC. Charles and Joanne Knight gave us $15 million. They deserve to have their name. It's the night ADRC. So no more abbreviations, KADRC. Eponym, lots of discussion about this. I think it is not Alzheimer's disease. He didn't own it. It is Alzheimer's disease. We no longer use dementia of the Alzheimer type. We say Alzheimer dementia. Our participants are not subjects. They are participants. They're working with us. So we call them participants. Participants that is incorrect grammar. We, participants who don't need an apostrophe when we're talking about this, 60s. Nobody here ever will use the term MCI. We'll, we'll rate the severity of the dementia and try to give its etiology. And the night ADRC clinical trials unit is what we're talking about. So my last slide, this is my final state of the ADRC presentation. The end of this month, July 1, David Holtzman will succeed me as director and principal investigator of the night ADRC. There isn't anyone more prepared and more qualified to take on the directorship of an ADRC than Dave. He's been the associate director of the ADRC for 15 years. So I will become the associate director. I'll join Randy Bateman, Carlos Cochaga, Krista Mulder. And I'm still the leader of the Knight ADRC's clinical core and of the Memory and Aging Project, which serves all of the grants. I'm also the principal investigator of the two program project grants, Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia and Adult Children's Study. So with that, I think I'll close and we'll see if there are any questions. Thank you very much.